and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies and TV shows with history. On today's episode, we're going to kick off a five-part miniseries about the HBO miniseries, Chernobyl. Why five parts? Well, because there are five episodes of the HBO miniseries, Chernobyl, and as of this recording, it is the highest requested topic to cover. So I wanted to take the time to dig into each one in a little more depth than a single episode for the whole miniseries would allow. To do this, we're going to bring back something old to create something new. If you're a longtime listener to Based on a True Story, you'll remember the days when there were no guests. It was just you and I learning something new. For this series, we'll do that again. And if you like it, let me know. Maybe we'll bring back some of these episodes with just us. Before we start our story today, though, it's time to set up our game. Two truths and a lie. If you're new to the show, here's how that works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true. And that means one. Well, one of them is an all-out lie. (laughs) Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one. Chernobyl's unit number four that exploded was an RBMK reactor. Number two. Valery Legasov did not commit suicide exactly two years to the second after the Chernobyl accident. Number three, unlike what we see in the series, Anatoly Dyatlov knew the reactor core exploded right away. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to identify which one of those was the lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. Speaking of episodes, the episode of Chernobyl we're going to be learning about today is episode number one. It's titled 12345. We'll find out what that means later on. And it originally aired on May 6th, 2019. How much of the first episode of Chernobyl really happened? I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is based on a true story. There's some text on screen that gives us a time and place. Moscow, April 26th, 1988. And while it's not included in the text, the camera shot behind the text is a clock giving us the exact time. It's 1.10. And since it's dark through the apartment window, we can assume that's 1.10 a.m. The apartment belongs to Valery Legasov, who's played by Jared Harris. He's just poured himself a drink and is listening to a cassette tape. On the recording, his own voice talks about how stories only want to know who is to blame. And in this story, the best choice was Anatoly Dyatlov, because he ran the room that night, and he didn't have friends, not important enough ones at least. So he'll serve 10 years in a prison labor camp. Legasov stops the playback, Then he hits the record button and continues the story where he left off. This time he's speaking into the cassette tape. He ends the recording by saying he's given everything he knows. They'll deny it, of course. They always do. He stops the tape and puts it with others. Five others for a total of six. Each tape is labeled with a number one through six. He wraps them all in newspaper and then walks outside to hide the bundle in a grate nearby. He also takes out his cat's litter, so it seems like he's just doing chores to the man in the car, obviously watching his house from the street. We can assume it's a KGB agent, although the series never really tells us for sure, and it seems to work because the man stays in the car. With that done, Legasov heads back inside. A few minutes later, we find out why the episode has the title 12345. It's the time. Looking at his watch, as the seconds tick closer to 1.23 a.m. and 45 seconds, that is exactly the moment when Legasov climbs up on furniture in his apartment and hangs himself. Then, the next shot we see transports us back in time exactly two years and one minute earlier. Then, of course, we see the explosion, which we'll get to in a minute. 
But before we do, we can tell from how the series sets up this opening sequence with the timing that it's saying Valery Legasov committed suicide exactly two years to the second after the Chernobyl accident. There's a lot of what we saw in the opening sequence that is true, but the biggest inaccurate thing here is the idea that Legasov committed suicide to coincide with the two-year anniversary of the explosion down to the very second. That's simply not true. It is true that Legasov committed suicide near the two-year anniversary of the explosion, but not necessarily down to the exact second of the explosion itself. In fact, as we'll learn about more in depth later on, there was more than one explosion. The truth is that Valery Legasov hung himself in his apartment on April 27th, 1988. That's two years and one day after the explosion. Or maybe he didn't intend for it to be timed perfectly with the explosion itself, but maybe it was because the next day on the 28th of April, 1988, that's when he was scheduled to release the outcomes of the investigation into the causes of the disaster. There are also some discrepancies to exactly where Legasov hung himself. Some sources say it was in his Moscow apartment, like we see in the series. Some say it was in the stairwell of his apartment complex. He didn't leave a note. So there's a lot of speculation as to his reasons. And my own speculation is that it probably is too close to the anniversary of the explosion to be a coincidence. What he did leave were tapes of his memories that he'd been recording since he became involved in the Chernobyl disaster. Some also point to something that we don't see in the HBO miniseries at all. It's not the first time he attempted suicide. For that, we have to go back to a time not associated with the anniversary of the explosion at all, back to the summer of 1987. But that attempt did not succeed, and for a while, Legasov threw himself back into work. Meanwhile, his health continued to fail due to the radiation he was exposed to, and on the two-year anniversary of the Chernobyl disaster, a proposal he had to launch a new committee on chemical research was rejected. That same day, he gathered all his personal belongings from his office. The next day, they found him dead at his apartment. While ostracized for his involvement during his life, in the aftermath of his apparent suicide, Legasov's tapes couldn't be denied. They were circulated in the scientific community, and eventually, extracts of them were published the following month, May of 1988. Nearly 10 years later, on September 20th, 1996, then-President Boris Yeltsin posthumously gave Valery Legasov the title of Hero of the Russian Federation, Russia's highest honorary title. But alas, even though the HBO miniseries starts at the end, we don't want to get too far ahead ourselves in the story. So let's go back into the timeline of the first episode now. There's text on the screen that we talked about a little bit earlier that tells us we're two years and one minute before Valery Legasov's suicide. Of course, as we learned, the series wasn't quite right with the timing of his suicide. But if we were to follow their timeline, then two years and one minute earlier would be April 26th, 1986, at 1.22 a.m. That timing is correct to set us up just before the explosion. We're in Pripyat, Ukrainian SSR. A woman named Ludmila Ignatenko, who is played by Jesse Buckley, happens to be awake to use the restroom. Afterwards, she goes to the kitchen to get a drink. She doesn't even notice the bright light in the distance out the window of her apartment. Then, a moment after we see the blast, the sound hits, shaking the apartment. That she noticed. So did her husband, Vasily, who wakes up. Together, they look out the window at the glow in the distance. The explosion throws a pillar of blue light into the sky that looks something like we'd expect to see in a science fiction movie. Before we go any further, I wanted to touch on how the explosion looked. What we see in this series is most likely pretty accurate. But I think we should also set some expectations. It's not like it was caught on film. So no one really knows what it looked like for absolute certainty. Remember, this was 1986. There weren't cell phones with cameras in everyone's pockets. There also weren't the same number of security cameras in houses, businesses, or even cars like we see today. It was also 1.23 in the morning. 
And Chernobyl was specifically built to be away from the huge city it provided power to, Kiev. Of course, now that's the city of Kyiv since Ukrainian independence following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. The city of Pripyat mentioned in this series is a real city. It's located about 62 miles or 100 kilometers away from Kyiv and was built in 1970 primarily as a home for people working in and around the Chernobyl power plant. By 1986, there were about 49,000 people who lived in Pripyat. For comparison, the city of Chernobyl itself, where the power plant was located, had about 14,000 residents in 1986. So that's another limitation to the eyewitnesses to the explosion. Not only was it the middle of the night in the year 1986, where automated monitoring technology just wasn't as common as it is today, but it's also not like there were millions of people around. With all that said, it's not like there was no one around either. There were people who worked at the plant 24-7, many of whom were alerted by the explosion itself, of course, and rushed to see what happened after the fact. To see the explosion itself, though, there were some people who just happened to be fishing nearby at that moment. And by nearby, I mean very nearby. You see, there was a pond near the power plant that held water used to cool the plant. That pond was also used to stock fish. That was something they used as a way of showing just how safe everything was. So there were a couple of guys who happened to be fishing in that pond about eight or 900 feet away, about 250 meters or so. That's how far they were from reactor number four when it exploded. According to these eyewitness accounts, there was a fireball that rose from reactor number four, or as they referred to it, unit four. Along with the fireball rose a mushroom cloud of smoke. A red column of light from the explosion turned blue as it rose into the sky, surrounded by the black cloud of smoke. It's probably not something you want to see coming from a nuclear reactor. But of course, that's also looking at things through a historical lens where we already have an idea of what happened at Chernobyl. At the time, they had no idea just how bad it was. Yes, there was an explosion. Two of them, actually, one right after the other. Yes, there was a fire. The fishermen just kept on fishing, though. There was no way they could have known how serious things actually were. Going back to the series, inside the control room right after the explosion, we can see the man in charge is Anatoly Dyatlov. He's played by Paul Ritter in the series. What just happened? Dyatlov asks the others in the control room as... Dust falls from the ceiling as a result of the blast. No one seems to know the answer. Then, someone named Perevalschenko bursts into the room claiming there's a fire in the turbine hall. After a moment's pause, Dyatlov figures it out. The turbine hall. That's the control system tank. Hydrogen, that would cause the explosion. He turns to two of the men working the controls, Akimov and Toptonov, and berates them. He blames them for blowing up the tank. That is all a pretty good dramatization of what most likely happened in the control room that night. I say it's most likely what happened because we have to rely on the memories of people who were there that night to piece together the story. Now, that's not unique to our story today. There's a lot of times in history where we can only rely on the memory of those who were there. But it's also important to know because memory can often be an unreliable interpretation of what happened, especially when it comes down to the specific things that we see in the HBO series, like who specifically said what. With that said, the men we see in the control room in the series were real people. Anatoly Dyatlov was the deputy chief engineer. Alexander Akimov was the chief of the unit shift. And Leonid Toptonov was the reactor operator. And it is true that one of the mechanics came into the control room to let them know the turbine hall was on fire. Not to skip too far ahead of where we are in the timeline of the first episode, but a little later in the first episode, there's some dialogue where Dyatlov, Akimov, and Toptonov are talking about the tank. Dyatlov mentions the tank on 71 is 100 cubic meters. Akimov corrects him, saying it's 110 cubic meters. While that sort of dialogue makes sense for people who work at Chernobyl to understand what all that means, for those of us who didn't, 
What they're talking about is the location of the control system tank. It was 71 meters or about 233 feet directly above the control room. It also held 110,000 liters or about 29,000 gallons of hot water and steam. As a quick little side note, that doesn't mean the series is wrong to mention hydrogen. Hydrogen can be created by the reaction between steam and the fuel used in the reactor. And since hydrogen is extremely combustible, it makes sense to assume the hydrogen was the cause of the explosion. But the location of the tank is important because something we don't see mentioned in the series is that Dyatlov expected all that hot water to start leaking through the roof of the control room that they were in at any moment. One of the orders we don't see him giving in the series that he actually did give was for everyone to move to an emergency control room. But the series probably just simplified this because it is true that they never moved. Everyone was too focused on the alarms and indicators in the control room, giving readings that they couldn't make sense of to pay attention to Degatlov's order to relocate. And since the ceiling hadn't started leaking yet, he didn't push the matter. After all, every second mattered. And he knew they had to keep the reactor cooled. This is important to keep in mind, though, again, because the more time that passed without the water leaking through the control room ceiling, the more that became an indicator to Dyatlov that maybe the explosion was not the control system tank. If we go back into the series, though, Paul Ritter's version of Anatoly Dyatlov has just come to the conclusion that it must be the control system tank that exploded. And so he orders water to be pumped through the core. All that matters now is to keep the core cool so the fire doesn't affect it. The man who bursts into the room stops Dyatlov and says, there is no core. It's exploded. Anatoly Dyatlov pauses for a moment at this, thinks it through, and then he disregards it. He's in shock. The man persists, saying he saw the lid is off. But Dyatlov won't believe him. RBMK reactor cores don't explode, Dyatlov replies. You're confused. This whole concept of refusing to believe an RBMK reactor could explode was true, but it wasn't because of a lack of education. If anything, it was quite the opposite. Their training was one of the main reasons they couldn't even fathom the reactor core was what had exploded. It was one of those things where the eyes saw something so unbelievable that the mind just couldn't comprehend the reality of it. There were simply too many fail-safes, too many safety systems in place for that to happen. It wasn't possible. Even some of the plant workers who saw the aftermath of the blast would later recall that their minds didn't want to believe what their eyes saw. To put it another way, they were simply blinded by their belief that the reactor was so safe it could never explode. Whatever had happened must have been something else. It couldn't be the reactor core. At least, that was the mindset for most people at the Chernobyl power plant that night. Of course, they would find out just how wrong they were. Going back to the series, we see Anatoly Dyatlov ordering the men in the control room to pump more water into the core to keep it cool. We talked about that briefly a little bit earlier. Now, if you're like me and not a nuclear engineer, right about this point in the story, it's very helpful to understand how nuclear reactors work. So remember where we are in the series with Dyatlov wanting to pump water into the core because it will make sense on the other side of this explanation of how reactors work. In a single sentence, nuclear reactors heat up water until it becomes steam, which spins a turbine to generate electricity. Of course, that is an extremely simplified version. There are different versions of nuclear reactors, but the one we hear about in the series is an RBMK reactor. And it is true that the Chernobyl reactor was an RBMK. RBMK stands for High Power Channel Type Reactor. Obviously, that is the English translation. The letters RBMK line up better with the actual Russian words, Reactor Bolshoi Moshnosti Kononi. But as you can tell from my butchered pronunciation, I can't speak Russian. So we'll stick with calling it a High Power Channel Type Reactor or just stick to RBMK. There are a few things about RBMK reactors that's helpful to keep in mind as we continue to learn about what happened at Chernobyl. 
One of those things is they're unique to the Soviet Union and now Russia, since there are still RBMK reactors around today, even though the Soviet Union is not. That means in 1986, no other country had engineers with experience with RBMK reactors, and there wasn't any other training for them outside the Soviet Union. And as we've learned so far, inside the Soviet Union, the training for RBMK reactors only ever implied they had so many fail-safes and safety systems that the idea of an RBMK reactor exploding, it was unfathomable. Another thing to keep in mind about RBMK reactors was that, well, Chernobyl wasn't originally supposed to be an RBMK reactor. It was supposed to be what's known as VVER, or the English translation for that is water, water, energy reactors. And that was the Soviet version of the same type of nuclear reactor that's in the United States, which is called pressurized water reactors, or PWR. However, they decided to build RBMK reactors in Chernobyl instead because RBMK reactors could output twice the amount of energy as a VVR reactor. And RBMK reactors could be built by machine plants that didn't have any sort of nuclear industry specific high precision equipment. So basically, RBMK reactors were cheaper and more powerful. That's a win-win, right? Well, if that were true, then we probably wouldn't be telling the story today. The last key thing to keep in mind about an RBMK nuclear reactor that I wanted to mention at this point in the story is that RBMK reactors use a graphite moderator on the control rods. No other reactor types do that. And we see graphite mentioned quite a bit in the HBO miniseries. So what does that mean exactly? To understand that, we'll have to dive back into how nuclear reactors work for a moment. So earlier we learned a nuclear reactor generates heat to the point of becoming steam. It boils, becomes steam, and then it generates electricity. The part that we're talking about here is how an RBMK reactor heats the water. It does that through something called a fission process. That's what happens when a neutron hits a larger atom, splitting it into two smaller atoms. Energy is released as well as additional neutrons, which can then repeat the process. That's the chain reaction. To help ensure the chain reaction continues more, something called a moderator is added to slow down the neutrons. That way you'll get a better chain reaction and catch them easier. And in the process, more energy is released. That results in more heat, which results in more steam, which results in more electricity. The fuel used for a nuclear reactor is uranium. The uranium is made into pellets that are stacked into a metal tube called a fuel rod. In an RBMK reactor, it's uranium-238 that's slightly enriched with uranium-235. The fuel rods with enriched uranium are positioned vertically inside the core of the reactor. The core of an RBMK reactor is graphite. Same thing used in pencils, although for a nuclear reactor, we're obviously talking about something much bigger, the graphite core is more like the size of a house. And the graphite is also a lot more pure than what we see in a pencil. In the core, there are 1,660 vertical holes. That's where the fuel rods are inserted. But it's not like there are 1,660 fuel rods inserted. You don't want the chain reaction to go on and on unchecked forever. So there are also what are called control rods. The control rods are made of a material called boron carbide. And in RBMK reactors, there are graphite tips on the control rods. That graphite tip will play a part in the story later. But the boron carbide is a material that absorbs the neutrons, which in turn slows down the fission reaction process. With all that explained, the basic process then is that cool water is pumped into the core. It cools the core down but it also flows around the fuel rods where the fission reaction heats up the water. Since heat rises, steam comes out the top of the reactor where the reactor design forces the steam to the turbine where electricity is generated. More cool water is pumped in, it cools the core, it's heated and leaves a steam. If things get too hot from the chain reaction generating too much heat than the water coolant can handle, then you insert more control rods to absorb the neutrons and slow down the chain reaction. And so on and so forth, the balance continues as electricity is generated. Okay, so in a nutshell, that is how RBMK nuclear reactors work. And yes, all that is still an extremely simplified version. 
but that will help us understand the rest of the mini series a lot better because it's a lot easier to understand how things went wrong when we know what they were supposed to be doing in the first place. Okay, so remember where we were in the miniseries? Anatoly Dyatlov gave the order to pump water into the core just before he left to go to the administration building. He's going to talk to Viktor Burkhanov and Nikolai Fomin. That really did happen. He did do that, but it wasn't the only order that he gave. And there were some changes there. That was just one of the orders that Dyatlov made after the explosion that would end up making an already terrible situation even worse. The order to pump water into the core was his primary focus, though. A big part of that has to do with what we talked about earlier, the disbelief that the core itself had exploded. But the indicators in the control room were also telling them that there wasn't any water at all flowing into the core. If the fuel rods didn't have any coolant, they'd melt. That would be bad. So he thought the huge graphite core was still there. And since they'd pushed the AZ-5 button, we'll hear more about that later in the series. But basically, that button inserts all the control rods into the core at once to completely halt the fission reaction. Since they did that, Dyatlov believed that all he had to do to cool down the reactor was to keep pumping cool water in. Since the chain reaction had been stopped with the control rods, the cool water wouldn't be heated anymore. And the any residual heat that was there would eventually cool off with more cool water added. At least, that was the idea behind his order to keep pumping the water into the core. He also believed the fission reaction had been shut down, like we talked about, but because the indicators were showing no water was being pumped into the core, that's why Dyatlov's order was to try and restart the emergency water pumps. Those had been shut off for the test, but now he ordered them to restart those pumps in an attempt to cool the reactor before the fuel rods melted. Or basically, as we see in the series, get water into the core as fast as you can. That will save the reactor and the fire brigade can then handle the fire before things get worse. That was the plan at first. Something we don't really see in the series, though, is that plan was more complex than it sounds because Dialov realized pretty quickly that the fission reaction had not been shut down like he thought at first. From the control room indicators, they could tell the control rods had not descended all the way like they were supposed to when they shut down the reactor, when they pushed the AZ-5 button. Not only that, but the control rods had stopped about one-third of the way down. That's additionally bad because, as we learned, the control rods in RBMK reactors have graphite tips. So not only was the boron not slowing down the fission reaction, the partially inserted control rods with graphite tips were basically acting just like the graphite core around it, increasing the fission reaction. Thinking fast, Dyatlov thought if the button to insert the control rods all the way didn't work, maybe they could be fully inserted manually. So he ordered a couple of the interns who happened to be in the control room, they were learning from the test, to go try that. But then he immediately realized, well, that's a bad idea because the control rods were huge. They can't be inserted through manpower alone. Even the manual controls required a servo motor. And that was powered by electricity. There wasn't any power, so the servo motor wouldn't help move the control rod, so there'd be no way that they could be lowered manually. But the two men had already left the control room at that point, so Dyatlov ran after them for a moment, but they were down the hall and out of sight. They couldn't have known it at the time, but they were trying to do an impossible task and running even closer to the exploded core. While he was in the hall outside the control room, Dyatlov noticed it was filled with dust and smoke from the fire in the turbine hall. That was a fire he already knew about, and one that we talked about briefly before when he found out about his decision to call the fire brigade to deal with the fires. If we go back into the series now, there's text on the screen to tell us it's 2.30 a.m. There are two things we see happening that we'll talk about. The first is what I just mentioned, the fire brigade coming. We'll come back to that in a bit. The other is when we see Viktor Bukhanov getting the phone call that wakes him up about the accident. He meets Nikolai Fomin at the administration building where they both go into what looks like a bunker with a long conference table in it. Dyatlov is already there and he starts filling them in on what happened. The basic concept of this is true, although it was actually around two o'clock in the morning when Burkhanov got the call to wake him up about the accident. It's kind of splitting hairs though. What's not splitting hairs is something that we see Khan O'Neill's version of Viktor Burkhanov tell Dyatlov that there's no way they can blame him for the accident. He was asleep when it happened. 
this whole conversation we see between Dyatlov and Rukhanov and Fomin in the series is a simplified version of what happened. In truth, they talked on the phone first. They didn't talk in person for a few hours after we see it happening in the series. Something else we don't see in the series is that even though Rukhanov didn't know the extent of the explosion that he'd gotten the call about, as he was taking a bus to the power plant, as that bus he was riding got closer, he noticed the top of Unit 4 was gone. At that moment, he knew he would be blamed for it. He was in charge of the power plant, so it didn't matter that he was asleep when things went wrong. It was a big enough deal that he would take the fall for it. Anything that goes wrong, you're the one in charge, so you're the one who takes the blame. That's how things worked in the Soviet Union. Talking to Anatoly Dyatlov also wasn't the first thing Brukhanov did when he arrived at the plant. He actually decided to investigate himself and went toward Unit 4. But he stopped when he saw pieces of graphite on the ground and the building next to the reactor hall in complete ruins. He didn't want to see more. So he went back to his office to make phone calls. One of those calls was to the chief of the night shift, a man who isn't in the series at all. His name was Boris Rogoskin. He was the one who had gone to the control room to talk to Dyatlov, Akimov, and Toptonov. So it was Rogoskin who told Rukhanov over the phone what Dyatlov had said. We pressed the AZ-5 button, and 12 to 15 seconds later, there was an explosion. The AZ-5 button is the emergency shutdown that lowers all the control rods into the core. We talked about briefly earlier, it's supposed to stop the fission reaction. It definitely was not supposed to cause an explosion. Once Brukhanov got off the phone with Rogoskin, he turned around and started calling his superiors to let them know about the accident, at least what they knew so far. After that, Brukhanov called Dyatlov to tell him to come over to the underground bunker to talk to him directly, similar to what we see in the series, but that wasn't until around 4 a.m., not soon after 2 a.m. like we see in the series. Speaking of which, if we go back to the series, we see the firefighters continuing to battle the flames. According to the series, they first arrived on scene around 1.30 a.m. We see shots of them here and there between things that we've already kind of talked about in the reactor. Time passes until around 3.30 a.m., and there's some dialogue between the firefighters that lets us know they've done everything they can from the outside. They need to start making their way to the roof now. We also see some of the firefighters reacting to some of the debris, debris that's molten hot in some cases, other debris that's not hot to the touch, but still causes burns after the firefighters pick it up. The series has so many different angles to tell the story. We don't really see everything from every angle, and that makes sense. But in the true story, by the time 2 a.m. rolled around, firefighters were starting to address the fire on the roof of Unit 3. It was connected to Unit 4. They quickly realized it was more than just a fire. Less than half an hour later, the firefighters were starting to get sick. They didn't know exactly what the cause was, but they knew enough about fighting fires to know there was something different this time. Still, there was a fire to be extinguished. We don't see this character in the HBO miniseries, but the commander of the fire department that responded was the 35-year-old Major Leonid Telyenkinov. By the time 2.30 rolled around, the fire on the roof of the reactor hall had mostly been extinguished, but Telyadkinov noticed his men weren't right. They were sick. So he ordered them to go in an ambulance to the Pripyat Hospital. An hour or so later, around 3.30 a.m., Telyadkinov and his men were battling the flames on the roof of Unit 3. Except he'd been exposed too much himself. So he went to the hospital himself, leaving the firefighters without their commander. This is way beyond the scope of episode number one, but it was actually closer to 7 a.m. when the firefighters finally had the flames extinguished. And since I mentioned episode number one, if we head back to the HBO miniseries, we're at the end of the first episode where a phone rings. Tying into the beginning of the episode, Valery Legasov is the man who answers the phone. On the other end of the line is Boris Trotobina. Through the conversation, Legasov finds out about the accident and that he's been assigned to a committee to manage the accident. Specifics of the conversation were surely made up for the series, but the basic concept here is true. Boris Trotobina was a real person. 
He really was in charge of the commission to get to the bottom of things. And to offer another bonus point to the accuracy of things, the creators of the series even found an excellent actor of the same age. The real Boris Shorbina was 66 years old in 1986 when he was put in charge of the commission. While the actor playing Boris Shorbina in the HBO miniseries, Stellan Skarsgård, was 68 years old in 2019 when the series was released, and probably a year or two younger, depending on when they actually filmed the series before being released. So that's a minor thing, but something I think worth pointing out to highlight the level of detail the creators went to in the series. Both Valery Legasov and Boris Shorbina were very real people involved in the true story. And those are two names we'll be hearing a lot more in our upcoming episodes as we dig into the rest of HBO's Chernobyl miniseries. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. If you want to learn more about the true story, I have a lot of great resources that I found in my research from overall articles and timelines and explanations to technical papers written by scientists and engineers to copies of Legasov's tapes that he recorded before he took his own life, uh, pictures, even some rare videos and things like that. All of those things can be found at the show's home on the web. But I want to mention three books in particular that I loved and found super helpful in researching this episode. The first is simply called Chernobyl by Serhii Ploki. Then there's Midnight in Chernobyl by Adam Higginbotham. And then Chernobyl 12340, the incredible true story of the world's worst nuclear disaster by Andrew Leatherbarrel. You can find links to those books and all the resources and follow the entire Chernobyl series in one place over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash Chernobyl. That's where all the episodes will be posted as they're released. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one. Chernobyl's unit number four that exploded was an RBMK reactor. Number two, Valery Legasov did not commit suicide exactly two years to the second after the Chernobyl accident. Number three, unlike what we see in the series, Anatoly Dyatlov knew the reactor core exploded right away. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with number one. Chernobyl's unit number four that exploded was an RBMK reactor. That is true. As we learned, the HBO miniseries was correct to say that reactor number four, as they called it unit four or unit number four, was an RBMK reactor. That type of reactor was unique to the Soviet Union, and its design was part of the reason for the explosion. Next is number two. Valery Legasov did not commit suicide exactly two years to the second after the Chernobyl accident. That is also true. And by being true, what I mean is it's true that Valery Legasov did not commit suicide at exactly 1.23 and 45 seconds on April 26th, 1988. He committed suicide on April 27th, 1988, and I couldn't find anything relating to the exact second, but the mere fact that it wasn't on the exact day also makes this concept, the series puts forward of him timing it exactly with the disaster as being incorrect. That means the lie is number three. Unlike what we see in the series, Anatoly Dyatlov knew the reactor core exploded right away. The miniseries was correct here when it showed that Dyatlov and many others thought it was a tank that exploded at first, and for a while, they all refused to believe it was the reactor core that exploded. As we learned, yeah, he wasn't the only one. No one thought the core could be what exploded because nothing in their training suggested RBMK reactor cores could explode. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you found it entertaining, if you find value in this podcast and you'd like to give a little of that value back, you can do that over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Once again, that's based on a true story podcast.com slash support. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon. <laughs>